Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the April webinar of the Canadian Open Data Society. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, since we since before we formally incorporated last year, we knew the pandemic would yield a, a wealth of data learning that we'd want to look back upon. So for this entire year, we'd hope to host a webinar much like this. Uh, yet we are still extremely lucky to have two of Canada's leading experts on the sourcing and presentation of COVID-19 open data with us today. Now, before I uh, introduce our guest host today, um, I will manipulate my cursor. <laughs> uh, please allow me to review some standard uh, introductory information for your consideration. Uh, first of all, our standard disclaimer, which I won't read off uh, word for word, but uh, is uh, worth considering. Um, uh, we always deal with subjects that are on the move. Uh, I, I forget how the French put it. Uh, uh, the idea on the march is definitely uh, open data helping the public and the governments uh, of the world respond to this, uh, to this crisis, to this emergency. Um, but uh, when we take that chance, um, completeness, uh, reliability, accuracy is a moving target. And so uh, we uh, ask you to rely on um, your own judgment uh, and uh, not necessarily uh, every single thing that you hear today. That's just our standard uh, clause, you might say. So I'm just going to try and let some more people in here. Very good. All right. Uh, I'll be introducing the society next. Oh. Um, some of you will know because you're visitors uh, to our previous webinars, uh, some of you this will be new, uh, so I hope this will be valuable. Uh, this is our vision, our mission, and our value proposition to our members. Uh, I'll have a little membership pitch at the end. Uh, we do want Canada to be a genuinely open society that empowers and improves the lives of its people. Uh, at the very least, uh, we're seeing how open data can uh, potentially help uh, save lives. Uh, in the current situation, uh, as it has done with weather data, uh, as it has uh, saved maybe even jobs or careers with uh, knowing when your bus is going to arrive. Uh, so uh, we think uh, there's a universe of insights left to be uh, tapped, and uh, we dedicate ourselves to that service. And uh, now I can introduce our guest hosts. Uh, uh, it's uh, my great honor to introduce uh, John Paul Soucy, uh, Vanier, Vanier Scholar and PhD student studying infectious disease epidemiology at the School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, co-founder of the COVID-19 Canada Open Data Working Group, uh, a, really a model for a lot of the things that we will want to do in the future, uh, and uh, Jens von Bergman, uh, the founder of uh, Mountain Math uh, with a doctorate in mathematics, uh, does data analysis in Vancouver and has worked with uh, Jean-Paul uh, on this uh, for the past year. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to our guests and let more people in. Great, uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Let's just uh, go on to the next slide and I will tell the uh, story of basically how the COVID-19 Canada Open Data Working Group began. Um, <clears throat> so it started with my colleague, uh, Isha Berry, who was part of an effort in early 2020 to, to kind of track every single case of COVID-19 around the world as part of a, a global group. And she was kind of responsible for the Canadian aspect of that. And come March 2020, this started to get to be of a, a bit of a bigger endeavor. And so uh, she asked me if I wanted to help, and I said, sure, and uh, let's throw together a dashboard to see uh, the situation in Canada, because at this point, there was no really official data set and no official way to see the entire Canadian picture of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, so that's basically what uh, we set to work out uh, a public data set for COVID-19 and uh, this public facing dashboard. And about two days before we went public with all of this, uh, there came out an article in McLean's that said, um, uh, this is what uh, Canada is up against in terms of flattening the curve. 
and it came with this subtitle, Inexplicably, the federal government is not publishing national infection numbers in a way that allows us to see the much discussed curve, so we've done it for them. And when I saw this, I realized, hey, there's a, a big demand for this and we're, we're uh, on the right track. Uh, so let's go to the next slide here. Talk about a few milestones in the group. Um, first of all, uh, you know, when we started this, certainly had no idea how much uh, time or, or energy it would take for the uh, one plus years uh, since it happened. But, uh, you know, we've had our, our data used by pretty much every every media organization in, in Canada. Um, and that's certainly been tremendously rewarding that we've been able to uh, to make that contribution. But I think uh, when it comes to figuring out who is actually using your data, the kind of dirty secret about, about these kind of open data project and open source projects is people generally only reach out uh, when things break or when they have a question. Uh, so I've, I've heard from you know, all sorts of businesses and public health units and industry groups and things like that. Uh, but usually it's only, it's only when, uh, when people have a question or when something breaks. And I guess the most surprising of these was um, one night when I, uh, I was doing the data push and I guess something went wrong and, and it didn't push correctly. And uh, the next morning I, I got an email from someone working for the Public Health Agency of Canada asking uh, when, when we'd be pushing our data next. And that's uh, how we learned that uh, internally our, our health region data were being used uh, by the Public Health Agency of Canada. And uh, eventually that, that led to using that uh, externally on their uh, situational awareness dashboard. Um, oh, no, we can stay at that last slide actually. Um, and um, I, I guess that probably says something about the state of, of kind of internal data sharing between provinces and the federal government, but Either way, it's uh, it's rewarding that uh, you know we've we've had our, our data used at, at such a level. And I guess the second the second one here is um, when we had uh, V Day here in Canada, which was I believe December fourteenth, when we first administered vaccines in uh, Ontario and in uh, Quebec. And uh, so we of course jumped to fill this gap as well. And as of early January. Um, we, we took a look at our world and data, which is one of those major data aggregating sites. And uh, in terms of vaccination data, I think we were the only non-governmental agency that was cited in terms of, uh, in terms of country level vaccination data. Um, eventually the, the federal government did, did release a, a, a federal vaccination data set, but um, at least at that point we were kind of where we were uh, in early March 2020, you know, kind of being the the only ones uh, providing that that real uh, pan Canadian picture of, of vaccination. So next, I'm going to talk about just some of the major challenges on the next slide. Uh, so first of all, the data sources are constantly changing. Um, this applies to really all all of the data we have uh, in Canada. Uh, when it came to the early case data, you know, we were looking at um, going through media reports, going through press releases, uh, scattered information on various websites. You know, this was before uh, the, uh, you know, the nice downloadable spreadsheets and, and dashboards from the provinces. Uh, so we were, you know, really, really getting data from all over. And eventually, you know, more, more data was, was released in, in kind of easier to ingest formats, but then we would see new new types of data release, so vaccine data, uh, variants of concern, um, and again, kind of when when that vaccine data came out initially, there was nothing on dashboards. There was just kind of scattered press releases. Uh, my colleague Isha, I think she said she would spend like three hours a night going through all the listening to all the press conferences and, and hoping that a reporter would ask about you know how many vaccine doses have been administered and things like that. But thankfully, just like with other COVID data eventually that that became to be um, more widely reported on on dashboards and things like that. But early on, it was basically a matter of just listening to press conferences for hours and hoping someone would ask about it. And there's also the question of how to harmonize data sources. So there's all sorts of variation in how data are reported across Canada, even until now. Uh, what defines a recovered person? What defines you know the testing numbers? 
um, what dates are used. So often they'll report using internal reporting dates, but basically we have to try to figure out how to harmonize all these things. And, and in terms of cases, we do that by basically reporting things on the date that they're publicly reported, as opposed to any of the kind of internal dates that might be used and kind of the new, the new frontier of data that are kind of rapidly improving. Uh, we hope are, are the variants of concern data. So we can go to the next slide. So what is the current status of the project? Uh, we're transitioning towards automation. You know, it's been over a year um, of, of this kind of data collection effort and data that are being released have, have gotten a lot better. And so, you know, we're, we're trying to focus our efforts where they're, they're most valuable. Uh, continuing our open data advocacy, we've we've had some success with this uh, in general, and, and that's something we'll we'll talk about later. And also uh, building a Canadian COVID nineteen data archive for the future. So uh, currently have a project started in August, which was to basically archive as much COVID nineteen data as possible, and that is currently just about twenty eight gigabytes of publicly available uh, COVID nineteen data, and it's uh, growing quickly. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about that project and where I see it going. Uh, so basically, uh, this archive, it's an it's a automated daily archive of, of a couple hundred COVID-19 data sets and web pages at this point. And uh, basically, I just want to, I think that this is kind of going to be the legacy of, of the group, and I want this to be uh, kind of the definitive archive of, for, for COVID-19 data, what happened with COVID-19 uh, for future researchers and inquiries and, and what have you. And, um, and as much as possible, I want to actually work on, on kind of transforming some of these data into stories. Um, and I'm going to give two examples of why, why this kind of archival stuff is important. So first of all, what inspired me to actually uh, pull the trigger and actually put this together, uh, which was in late August. Uh, was this story out of Iowa. So it turns out that um, people in Iowa had been saving the uh, case data set from Iowa uh, every day, and they noticed that when they were plotting it, that there were new positive cases being added like months and months back. And um, it turns out what was happening was uh, if you had been tested multiple times, so let's say you had been tested in, in March of 2020 and tested negative, and then you were tested in August of 2020 and you tested positive, they actually assigned the positive case to the first time you were tested. So you would have actually been recorded as, as testing positive in March, even if that actual positive test had, had happened uh, in August in this example. And so what this would do was it would um, it would kind of underestimate the current like positivity rates of tests. And this was really bad because this was one of the, the main metrics that they were using to, uh, to actually control school, whether schools were online or, or in person. And because of this data error, which was discovered by people keeping archived copies of this data set, uh, that got fixed. And, you know, the metrics and the data being used to make decisions got better. And so that is actually the story that kind of really convinced me to to start working on this. And the second thing is um, I get requests all the time from journalists in Quebec looking for uh, long-term care uh, reports. Uh, so this was, you know, what has happened with, with long-term care in this country during the pandemic, unfortunately, has, has risen to the level of, of humanitarian crisis. And uh, in, in Quebec, there's these daily reports released about, you know, the number of cases in, in particular long-term care homes, and journalists are understandably interested in this uh, to kind of tell the story of, of how this outbreak, how this crisis happened. Uh, but once those reports are posted, and they're posted daily, they wipe out the old information and just keep the new information. So those old information, if you don't hold on to it, uh, is gone. And so recently, for example, I, I had a reporter reach out to me saying, look, I've been talking to the Quebec government for months trying to get these old, uh, these old reports uh, that, that tell the story of, of cases in, in long-term care in Quebec, and I really haven't gotten anything from them. And I say, oh, I have every single one from October onwards uh, publicly available uh, on, on our data archive. And so that's been of, of tremendous use to a lot of people. Um, let's go to the next slide. And uh, one thing that's kind of gratifying, I think, is I've actually managed to use this archive data to kind of 
uh, incorporated into my own thesis research. So I'm a PhD student in infectious disease epidemiology, and uh, I've done some kind of writing about epidemic curves. Uh, so if we look on the on the left here, for example, this is um, the epidemic curve by by symptom onset date. Uh, so understandably, newly discovered cases get you know backdated, which makes it look like there's very few cases in the recent days because those cases haven't been discovered yet that had very recent symptom onset dates. And so you get this kind of like downward curve in the most recent days, no matter what the actual trend is. Uh, but if you plot it by public reporting date on the right, you see that the uh, the correct trend is always is always shown. Um, whereas on the left here, uh, using the archived case data sets from Ontario every day, you know, you see that the actually the curves are kind of retroactively filled in as you go through uh, newer and newer versions of the data set. So I'm actually using some of these data that I've archived to kind of uh, write more about uh, about these epidemic curves. Uh, so let's go to the next uh, next slide. All right, so now we're going to talk about actual COVID-19 data and some of the major things that have uh, that have happened over the past year. So first of all, I want to talk about open data in general and kind of take a step back and, and kind of justify why this is actually important. Um, you know, it's not just the fact that we're all uh, data junkies and we like to play with data, although that is true. Uh, but I think, um, you know, there would always be the, the question of, well, you know, the job of public health isn't to, to kind of create these data sets for us to play around with. You know, they're doing much more important work of actually responding to the public health pandemic. Um, but I would argue that actually open data is part in this and an essential part of the public health response itself. Um, you know, we've asked people for over a year now to make tremendous sacrifices in the name of, of public health. And I think if we're transparent with the data that are used to make these decisions, uh, then that um, kind of contributes to feeling like these public health interventions are something that we're all a part of, as opposed to something that's being, you know, done to us. Um, and it also creates a sense of public ownership around data. And um, we've seen that a lot of the best visualizations, a lot of the best communications, a lot of the best analysis has come not from the people who are actually producing these data, uh, but actually from you know, members of the public, people such as Jens, for example. Um, and we've seen that there's been a, a tremendous, uh, you know, intellectual and surveillance uh, contribution um, and, and policy discourse because these data are publicly available. And the third point is, and this is something that certainly I've experienced, is when we're when I'm you know releasing data or code publicly, uh, it incentivizes um, me to document and uh, and make sure that that data is of high quality. And I think that that probably applies in in all walks of life. So uh, if these data are public, they're going to be better not only for external use but for internal use as well. Uh, so next slide. So I would say my general assessment here is that the governments over time have tended towards greater da data transparency. There are exceptions to this rule, which I'm sure Jens can speak to, um, but uh, also data have become more granular. So we've seen a lot of, for example, city level data, uh, individual level data from cities like Ontario. Um, here's a, a graphic from, from Montreal I prepared uh, a number of months ago. Um, and also open data has improved the discourse around the COVID-19 response. And I actually do have a number of uh, examples of that that we can, we can discuss. Uh, so a couple of turning points in, uh, in COVID-19 data uh, are, the, first of all, this example in October 2020 of, um, of COVID-19 uh, positivity in Toronto by neighborhood being leaked, which led to uh, the realization uh, that we had much higher rates of positivity in certain um, underprivileged and, and lower socioeconomic status neighborhoods. And this led to this, this data actually becoming a, a regular official data release uh, not long after. And it also improved the public discourse on how to actually address these inequalities in COVID-19 transmission, things like targeted testing, uh, mobile testing, uh, pop-up testing in these areas. Uh, and the second example on the next slide would be um, more recent. So this is uh, regarding ICU numbers in Canada. It turns out that uh, 
from province to province, there's actually quite a large variation in, uh, in how these numbers are reported, these ICU and hospitalization numbers. Uh, until recently in Ontario, uh, if you were no longer contagious, no longer testing positive for COVID-19, you would be removed from the list of people in hospital or in ICU due to COVID-19, even though, of course, you were still there due to COVID-19 complications. And of course, there are implications if you're contagious or not regarding infection control, but I think what people really care about is how many people are there due to complications of COVID-19. So once this issue was raised by uh, journalists and, and kind of discussed by open data advocates, uh, we did eventually see those numbers uh, corrected for Ontario. There's still other provinces that are still reporting just people who test positive, unfortunately. Um, but this, this, especially in Ontario, this made quite a bit of a difference. Uh, I think there was up to a difference of like 40 people in ICU at um, if you looked at the old versus the new numbers, um, and considering that our, you know, bad thresholds were initially set around 200 or 300, um, you know, that 40 people actually makes quite a bit, bit of a difference. Unfortunately, these, uh, these graphs are, are quite outdated now, and, and the number is, uh, is more like 800 uh, as of today. And the final, uh, final point I wanted to mention in terms of, uh, a turning point on the next slide uh, was, uh, again, how open data helped to improve the conversation and improve policy. Um, so here in Ontario, we have FSA level test positivity um, and vaccine coverage data, uh, FSA being forward sortation area, the first uh, three numbers of the postal code, or the first, first three characters of the postal code. Uh, we get these data weekly. And uh, if you plot them all out, you'll see, for example, in Toronto, that some of the worst hit neighborhoods in terms of, uh, in terms of transmission actually have the lowest uh, vaccine coverage. And uh, this led to discussions of how to ameliorate that. And we saw that now we have uh, targeted vaccinations for uh, those 18 plus in these hard hit neighborhoods uh, in order to try to, to reduce some of these uh, inequalities. And because of these data, we have uh, informed dialogue, we have transparency in the data that are being used to, to make those decisions, you know, which neighborhoods are, are designated as, as uh, prioritized for vaccination. And we can also hold the government accountable for uh, the policies that are used to ameliorate that. And we can see if these, these policies actually work. Um, there's been some discussion of, oh, well, you know, this would violate privacy or stigmatize neighborhoods. But I think uh, far from that, we've actually seen that um, what, what it's done is, is us to actually uh, point out these inequalities, have an informed discussion about them, and, uh, and actually lead to, to positive policy, policy change to try and ameliorate those inequalities. And uh, just the last uh, notes I wanted to, to end on here uh, were two kind of open data inspirations um, for myself at least. Uh, the first was the COVID-19 uh, tracking project, which somehow ended up covering up with the logo here. Um, but this was a, a US tracking project supported by the Atlantic, um, which, you know, they had all sorts of data for, for every state and territory in the United States. And they had regular analyses, really, it was an extraordinary effort. And um, they kind of had these, these two essays uh, near the end of the project, they shut down one year after they began collecting data in uh, in March of 2021. And uh, I would highly recommend that you read both of these essays. They're very interesting. And um, I'll just highlight two two quotes uh, from them. So one of the reasons they they shut down was they felt that they had uh, they accomplished their goals more or less, um, and that the work of compiling, cleaning, standardizing, and making sense of these data was properly the work of the federal government, and that eventually the federal government did did step in to, uh, to, to, do, to do this work. And uh, they also talked about some of the decisions they made uh, during this process, uh, including not tracking vaccinations. And one of the reasons they said they did this was because they didn't want to provide any cover for federal agencies to be slow with actually compiling these data themselves. Uh, so I thought uh, both of these were very informative reads and I would, I would recommend that uh, you check out their website and, and read some of their kind of wrap up essays. They're, very, very interesting from an open data perspective. And uh, the last uh, group I think we should really highlight as open data inspiration on the next slide were uh, the journalists. Uh, so they, they've done an extraordinary job in, in you know, making sense of, of the data that are coming out, trying to reconcile some of the contradictions we've seen. 
Um, and also just highlighting that uh, in many ways, Canada is behind some of our, our peer nations in terms of uh, open data, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, what, what we have access to uh, from the government. Uh, secrecy by default is what Robin Urbach said, which I think uh, in many ways is uh, an accurate characterization. But we've seen a lot of progress throughout this pandemic, and I think that's something we have to, to celebrate, to hold on to, and to, uh, to further. So without any further ado, I'll, I'll let Jens, uh, Jens uh, speak, because I have been uh, hogging the conversation this entire time. Well, that was, uh, that was great. Um, I must say, I'm sort of a bit of an outsider when it comes to providing this data and assembling this. So I haven't been part of this process. I've been on the consumer side of the data. I was probably one of the early consumers, I'm guessing. Well, I built a dashboard, like a small dashboard. I forgot when, but it was fairly early on that just showed some Canadian data also at the health region level. And um, it basically took like the, um, um, it did lock, semi-log plots to kind of give a mini model of where the trajectory is going. Um, so um, just to highlight the, um, the exponential nature of the growth and show this and I fit, I think an exponential, um, sort of a rolling exponential fit. And so, so those were basic plots I did just to show um, what is happening um, to case data. Case data was very hard to interpret at the time. Testing was funky. Um, everybody tested in different ways. Like in BC, we focused on healthcare workers, testing capacity was limited. So everybody kind of tried to just figure things out. And it was interesting that this data just wasn't available. And um, I was actually quite shocked, um, but grateful that the Open Data Working Group um, provided this. And um, the amount of work that went into this is just absolutely amazing. So I did see at some point I was um, checking out the Slack channel of the Open Data Working Group. And it was just amazing to see what was flying by there, the struggles these um, people had and the amount of time spent to detail the cases was, um, I mean, it was just beyond belief. So um, an incredibly valuable service was provided there. Um, a couple of things that I really liked about the presentation that I wanted to talk to is um, sort of the, the fact that the federal government was consuming, again, this data that should have come from the federal government. It's kind of like the snake eating its tail. Um, but this is also really something you want to see in open data. So this is, this is a feature. So in many ways, when um, data does become open and people add value to those things and then government again tabs into that and consumes that themselves. This is something we want to see. In this case, the, the sort of front part wasn't working because um, the government didn't provide this data in the first place. But in many ways, um, this, is, this is really a feature of, of an open data society where um, when the government comes in and starts consuming some of the um, derived products from open data. And um, so, uh, so I think that's, that's a good measure to see if open data is actually useful and actionable and um, being used if it feeds back into government. So I don't know if you have thoughts on, on, on these things, uh, Jean-Paul. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think uh, something that, that struck, uh, uh, struck me in, in kind of our pre-conversation the number of us had uh, had before this presentation was you know just the the government can't do everything you know and uh, and probably the the primary role there should be as a as a data provider um, and and leaving kind of some of the, the sophisticated uh, uh, visualization and, and communication stuff to you know people who have those uh, those expertise specifically and and who you know like to to run with data and um, and make those those kind of science communication products, um, but yeah, we've we've you know clearly seen that um, there are issues with with how data are shared here in Canada. But uh, you know, I think um, that's certainly not exclusive to our country. I think in in all over the world, really, 
uh, we've seen that the the best communication and the best uh, visualizations have come from from outside of government. Um, just in terms of, you know, uh, if you look at the journalist John Byrne Murdoch, I believe from the Financial Times, you know, his his early plots with respect to to showing the trajectory of COVID nineteen and and all of the uh, all of the countries around the world, his ongoing analysis has been enormously influential. Um, yeah, the COVID-19 tracking project in the United States, as I've mentioned, um, you know, I guess kind of humbled the, the CDC to some, some degree in the sense that uh, we saw that these, these volunteers backed by a, a journalistic organization, um, but, you know, this, this large network of volunteers were able to mobilize these data and figure out all these contradictions and differences in, in how things were being reported and uh, just try to provide a, a simple and harmonized product. Uh, and they were able to do that, you know, more so than, uh, than the CDC was, you know, I think it's, it's humbling to see that we have such a, a wealth of expertise in the, in the community. And I think you make a good point that, um, that kind of, you know, we do have this, this, uh, the seeds of this open data society out there already. And I think that's something that uh, going forward in, in this country and around the world, we need to, we need to foster because uh, clearly there is enormous benefit from from uh, this kind of partnership between uh, between the the governments and the public health and and uh, the people. Yeah. So one thing that I find interesting too is even within Canada there is uh, big differences in terms mm -hmm. of data sharing. Yeah. And um, like I'm sitting in BC and I'm looking at Ontario and I'm thinking, wow, these guys got data. That's great. And uh, people in Ontario, of course, are also looking at their data and saying, well, we actually have problems with our data too. And uh, it's, it's not just you guys over there. Um, but there's a couple of things that I really found interesting, like the, the data leak of the um, FSA level data. Um, first of all, the, the forward citation level data, um, it's great just looking at the fact that you have forward sortation um, level data is I find amazing because in BC, we only get health region or health authority or health community level data. So only things that have historically been health related. This is the only way data is shared. Now, these kind of historic health regions, um, I'm not sure how they initially started, but they haven't kept up with developments on the ground. And it has led to um, geographies that are pretty much useless. So a standard example would be right now we have um, we we have a lockdown coming in. We are not supposed to travel across health authority boundaries. But these health authority boundaries make no sense whatsoever. Um, for example, in in Vancouver, um, there is a boundary that um, where Burnaby and the city of Vancouver that are fairly integrated in in travel and anything, just um, transit that goes across there and uh, fairly integrated, but it's a hard boundary now that you're not supposed to cross. They're starting to soften this again, saying, well, maybe we didn't mean it this way, but um, sort of the whole idea of data that's meaningful to people, how people live, how people move, that hasn't been part of, of it at all. And the forward sortation area is sort of a middle ground. It's an easy way to collect, easy geography to collect data on, and it makes somewhat sense. Um, it is, um, it respects city boundaries to some degree. And um, it, it's a, a lot more useful geography. Uh, I hate it in many ways too, but <laughs> it, it just shows how, um, how different the outlook is. And the leak leading to um, data then being released where the government says, oh, this has been leaked. It's been useful to people, people want it. So we're gonna release it. In BC, we kind of have the opposite here. So uh, there have been data leaks, um, you know, I get emails, other people get emails and data has been leaked and shared. And um, the response is, if I look again at my inbox where people are saying, well, now the data is restricted internally. And uh, we are now internally not getting this data anymore because people are worried about data leaks. And um, so th the data in question is, is a, you know, very high level um, non-private data on variants of concern, just on screening variants of concern. We're talking here about a simple percentage of how many 
uh, what share of overall cases in all of BC on a given week have been variants of concern. So there's basically no privacy um, whatsoever associated with this. But um, this has led to an internal um, tightening of data sharing. Um, so, so reactions can be in the opposite way too. Yeah, I, I definitely appreciate um, that in in Ontario here. It certainly seems that we've, uh, as a province, have kind of leaned into, um, you know, additional information being uh, being made available. You know, whether that's through, uh, you know, journalists asking questions about, hey, why are these um, why are these ICU numbers not matching uh, what we're seeing from you know critical care services Ontario who don't release their data regarding ICU, but you know, there's some people who are sharing it on, you know, social media anyway, who receive like those reports. Um, and it turns out it's because those ICU numbers aren't what we thought they meant. And so um, to their credit, uh, Ontario then, you know, released this revised data set and actually broke it down with, you know, people who are uh, total people in ICU due to COVID-19 complications, and then those who are still contagious, and then those who are not. Um, so not only could you, you know, compare it to the previous data, but then, you, you know, you had that kind of more accurate, more uh, relevant picture. Um, and then you have the example of, yeah, the neighborhood level data being leaked and then very soon becoming an official product because, you know, it, it led to, to some kind of outrage in, in the inequalities that were, um, that, you know, we suspected were there, but we couldn't really point to anything concrete before that. Um, and I think um, with, with regard to the example of, of, you know, looking at the FSA level positivity and vaccine coverage data and hotspots, you know, I think I heard that BC was planning on on doing something with respect to that, seeing uh, geographically targeted for, for the lower age groups. Uh, but in terms of what I've seen with vaccine data in, in BC, I mean, there's really no way to actually track the success or, or, or you know, how those decisions are made, whereas in Ontario, we can. And, um, you know, I think it's in terms of the government response, I think, you know, having that accountability and transparency in how these decisions are made is extraordinarily useful. Um, and that's just, yeah, something you see a uh, very significant heterogeneity across Canada in the, in the attitude to, uh, to that decision making process. I think that's a really good example of um, where the data was given out ahead of time. Mm -hmm. People have noticed these discrepancies outside. There was a discussion, then things got changed, those actions. So there was transparency. The data wasn't released um, to basically support a decision that had already been made. The data was released um, independent of that. And I think that builds a lot of uh, trust and transparency that's, that's really important in BC. Um, uh, BC has, of course, seen this. And I think, uh, to their credit, at least public health has checked internally. And what we have now in BC is a list of, I think it might be about eight health neighborhoods. So this is a, again, a health level geography where they, um, the finest one they have, where they've released uh, case data for the past week. So um, per population, uh, what we don't know is say, what's the next hardest hit one and why was a cutoff being made right there and not the other ones because none of the other data has been released. So we don't really understand how these decisions have been made. And like you said, we, we can check later on if, if the effect is visible. Um, so not having this data ahead of time available, not having a complete list for the data, but only for specific regions for which actions were announced. We don't even know if these are the hardest hit ones or not. We, we just don't have that list. Um, so I do trust public health to make the right decision on this. But I believe that um, having full information would be very useful to really explain these policies to people, especially uh, given our vaccine shortage. Um, this is something where, where people really, I think where you have to make a good point and explain things well, which, which we don't hear. Um, so it, it's, it's interesting to watch this contrast. I see a hand up by uh, Jim. Thanks. Uh, I really enjoyed this presentation. I have a question for John Paul. Uh, so from a sustainability point of view, it sounds like you have a long-term vision for this data to become, uh, as you described it, you know, the go-to source for COVID-19 data. Um, so I've, 
I'm the director of the Pacific Institute for the Mathematical Sciences, and it's been my pleasure to write some supporting letters for the NSERC funded EIDM projects. Uh, several of these projects um, have plans to build computational tool chains hosted in the cloud that would be consumers of the data in some ways that, uh, that Jens described. Um, would you and your collaborators be interested in working together on some uh, ways to merge this data into those computational tool chains and making it more long-term and sustainable? Yeah, absolutely. We should uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, after the presentation and uh, we can talk about that. Yeah, I definitely, as I said, yeah, I definitely uh, want this to be, uh, to be, you know, the only, only the first step is actually getting all these data together. You know, we want to, to kind of add metadata and um, kind of pre, pre-transform it to be useful. Um, you know, there's a lot of it that's stuck in HTML or PDF or what have you. So there's all sorts of opportunities for, for collaboration here. And um, I, would, uh, I would definitely look forward to, to talking about that more. Thank you. Um, we have a question on the chat from Suzanne. Um, might the data visualizations from outside of government be better in part because they are not constrained to be accessible? Hmm. Yeah, I think that's totally a fair, a fair point. Um, that's, you know, that's something that certainly I, um, you know, I, I would imagine there are quite a few elements of, for example, our own dashboard that, that are not accessible, uh, elements that are tables and text and things like that. But um, yeah, I think that's a completely fair point and probably something that, uh, that we should pay more attention to in the future. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, a great point to bring up. Well, perhaps we could um, launch into the um, question and answer uh, part of this. Is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Uh, one comment I still wanted to make about the archive, um, which is an extremely valuable tool. So I've used it um, already on several occasions. Um, one is that um, in BC, we always, uh, there's some backdating going on too. So, and, and um, I know now why this happens. Uh, unfortunately, it's not, not explained, um, but um, some people in the labs have explained it to me that there's um, cases that get retested just because maybe the first test wasn't as conclusive as they wanted, and then it gets dated back to those tests. So these things do happen. But um, the archive gives an opportunity, um, A, to explain how big is this effect, but also then um, if you do modeling, um, what you get is a mild bit of right censoring where about five to 10% of cases in the last day is always lower. But you can go back in the archive and um, figure out what the pattern is in that and build it in so, so that you have a more up-to-date picture of what to expect, which is great. Um, and <clears throat> The other part is, of course, if you want to do actual modeling um, and you want to predict and see how good your model is, what you really want to do is not take the current data and cut it off at a date, but take the data as it was delivered at a certain date and use that and see how that performs. So it's sort of an essential tool to, to use for, for any of these, these purposes. So um, we can do it in a simple way to do some now casting to get rid of those, those errors. And um, I mean, John Paul had this great way about um, episode onset date versus report date and how these work. But again, if you look at those two curves, the episode onset date was much cleaner data. It has uh, had less noise in it than the other one. So really what you wanna do is if you're serious about this, you wanna use the episode onset date, but use the reporting date and the lag that you derive from those to now cast the data and work off that. So there are great opportunities um, that, that come from having this archive. And the last one is of course, that there are people that ask questions like, oh, things changed and they're different now. How did they change? And um, you know, all wild conspiracy theories sometimes coming my way. And it's, it's very nice to just be able to direct people to, to the archive and saying, actually, we have a complete archive of this, thanks to Jean-Paul and uh, here you go and just check it out. And, um, it's, it's not quite what you think it is. So th these are all great, great ways to use. 
Yeah, absolutely. And um, there's lots of stuff that I have not captured yet because it doesn't quite fit into to how the, the tool is, is working. Things like um, daily bulletins and daily reports and weekly reports and things like that from all the provinces, which uh, I would love to capture. And if anyone is interested in uh, expanding this archive and open data effort and you know, capturing data, then feel free to uh, reach out to me. You can Google my name uh, or go to my website, uh, jprs.me, and uh, and I would be happy to to uh, receive whatever whatever data you may have or may find and uh, make it available. I just uh, put that uh, URL into the chat. JP, it's Rob James from BC. Uh, it seems to me that there are a couple of threads here, that, that things I wanted to say. First of which is, has been, there really are three pieces here. One has been the availability of open source software to, to drive a lot of the innovation that you've been, uh, that you and others have been doing. The second has been the, the sort of data capturing issue that you've talked a lot about. But the third piece I think that you've really brought to the table, you and Jens in particular has been, um, uh, real analytic expertise that we're not seeing coming out of, of governmental agencies. And I think it's that analytic expertise that has been, that's really taken the, the data capturing tool that you've talked about today and, and given it value and policy salience. And I, and I, I think I want to underscore that, that additional contribution that you and others have made. It's really be, been crucial for, um, for moving the policy uh, environment forward over the last year. And I think a lot of us are grateful to, to both of you and others for all of the analytic work as well as the archival work that you've undertaken. The last thing I wanted to say was you probably have a resource that is in the in the data set that you've, you've captured that is of, of uh, literal archival interest. And at some point, I'd encourage you to uh, try to reach out to the Public Archives of Canada, because I think you have an archive that no one else in the country has. And it would be uh, tragic to see it disappear in five or 10 years when servers are shut down and you move off to different projects and things. And um, so I would encourage you to think about um, the task of, arch of actually archiving this and depositing it with uh, uh, the Public Archives of Canada. It's a real contribution to public health in the country. Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's a great idea, and we've definitely <clears throat> on the on the policy side, analysis side, certainly here in Ontario, we've we've tapped into the you know the analytical expertise that's that's available in uh, in the province with the you know the Ontario Science Table, Modeling Consensus Table, and and you know to Ontario's credit, I think they've they've done a good job at at kind of letting letting the uh, the Science Table um, kind of have a, a spotlight, um, you know regardless of whether their advice is being followed or not. Um, so I think, I think that's been, uh, that's been good at, at kind of tapping into the, the <laughs> piece that's in, that's in the community. Um, but yeah, no, I appreciate the comment regarding, uh, regarding the archives. It, it's not something I had thought about, but it's a, uh, it's a good idea. And um, yeah, I appreciate the comment. I'm not quite sure how one approaches the, uh, the archives of Canada. They will have, have archivists who are experts in in preservation of digital objects, um, but that may be something that the Open Data Society could uh, open that discussion. I think we'll take that up at the society level as well, uh, Rob. Um, I think that's a fabulous suggestion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. I'd like to encourage people. We still have a few few more minutes, and. Um, and I'd like to encourage people to ask uh, questions, raise their hand, uh, you know, unmute themselves. <laughs> We've got these uh, two fellows here uh, for uh, another 10 minutes or so. Uh, please take advantage of the opportunity. Okay, I'll take the bait. Uh, so the situation with COVID is, I think, revealing the importance of open data and uh, data in policy discussions like Jean-Paul uh, made really clear arguments about at the top. Um, we have, of course, a longer term crisis with climate change and similar data challenges. I know there's activity um, at the UN right now with the creation of CODES, the um, Collaboration on Digital and Environmental Sustainability, 
which is trying to look at similar ways that data and sustainability can be worked on. So maybe a question more for the Open Data Society. How do we build on the success of open data and public engagement, citizen science and modeling to try to make better data-driven policy become the standard? Like how do we convert on this, you know, some success here uh, and build that into society more completely using COVID as an example? Uh, well, speaking merely as the executive director of uh, the society, I'd have to say our first efforts uh, involve meetings such as this where we can evoke the full story through give and take, through dialogue and presentation. And then the second stage to my mind is to actually uh, convey these examples um, and how it, all, it worked out well for everybody involved, more or less, um, to uh, policymakers with um, a certain sense of relatability to their challenges and their opportunities uh, within their respective policy fields. Uh, this may sound very step-by-step, uh, <laughs> step, not very revolutionary, but I, I do believe in collaboration and telling good stories and, and relating to people. And, and then if they ignore you, then start going. <laughs> the nice thing about a lot of the causes that we have identified uh, in our advocacy committee is that you can usually find a jurisdiction where they have already gone ahead of us in Canada or in a part of Canada, and it is possible to show that it has worked out pretty well in the end. And, and so that will be our, I think, our first uh, couple of steps. But uh, I do encourage uh, everyone, um, I'll have a little blurb at the end, but I do encourage everyone to get involved with the society and with uh, things like our advocacy, advocacy committee uh, to, the, to these ends that you've described. Thank you. So one thing that I see here too is um, sort of to add to the value chain. Open data sort of sits at the bottom of it. But uh, really what I think we need more emphasis on too is open analysis. Um, so analysis that's built on open data that is reproducible. Um, so if you wanna be impactful, I think the world's gotten complicated. Uh, we don't just have an expert anymore that says something and then things move on. That's just not how it works anymore. Um, so the, the way I see this forward is that we want to build um, the, um, the whole transparency from the data ideally even on the data collection process have input, then have the data, then have open analysis that is reproducible that people can adapt if they want to, and that you can pitch one type of analysis against another. And you have a, um, a group of, of users um, that are knowledgeable enough at least to do some parts of it. Maybe some can do their own analysis, some can maybe understand or just reproduce an analysis um, some can just interpret the results of an analysis uh, in a way so that you have a deeper understanding within society of these results and to drive sort of a deeper change this way. And I think that applies to things like COVID where um, you have different independent modeling groups now coming out and providing some of this um, to supplement or contrast um, analysis coming from other sources um, and that publish their code and the analysis with it. Um, and similarly, I think we, we want to see this move into government too, where if there is decisions that affect the general public, we should have publicly available data and public open analysis driving this. And um, so this is the level of transparency that I would like to see from, from government too, um, when it comes to policy making and not just some report that somebody made somewhere and that is locked up even, um, but really a full, full chain from open data to open analysis to then driving transmissions and I think uh, decisions. And I think that's what um, um, elevates again, the importance of open data by having this added value added, added later. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, yeah, just to highlight that, um, yeah, not just open data, but open analysis, open code. I think, you know, personally, I'm trying to have open code for all the, you know, all the work I'm doing going forward. It's not always possible to have kind of open data, open code, if you're using data, which are, you know, personal, have personal or private information or what have you, but, you know, a lot of the analyses 
that are being done that are policy relevant are not using those data and uh, very easily could could be uh, could be open analyses. And uh, I think that that would more than likely uh, increase increase the quality. Certainly, when I know that I'm posting code, I've you know made sure it's nice and relatively readable, and I've you know caught mistakes and errors, uh, some minor, some major, you know, when uh, when preparing that. So I think uh, not only would it result in in kind of better transparency and better understanding of, of the policy process, but also probably better internal analysis as well. Um, so I think uh, I think that's a great point. And even if it contains part of the data is not um, part of the data in an analysis that goes in is not public for privacy reasons, which can happen and is is um, is fine. You can still publish the code, um, and that still adds a level of transparency of how the analysis was done. So uh, there's still value to that. Absolutely. Well, with just five minutes to go, uh, I guess I'd like to uh, thank uh, you, gentlemen, for. Uh, participating. <laughs> we have someone in the waiting room. You know what? I'm going to let them in just the same. Um, bear with me a moment. <laughs> because uh, at this point, uh, I would like to uh, thank our guests, our guest hosts for uh, for all of this. I think this is truly going to be uh, a webinar for the ages that we're going to have viewed a lot, uh, if that's okay with everybody on, on YouTube, um, among our, uh, our, our subscribers. And um, I'm going to share a link with you uh, with our pitch to uh, join the uh, Open Data Society. Uh, it's a mere $5 per month. And uh, until we have our first annual general meeting in September at which members will be able to vote and stand for election to our board and committees, uh, you would be forever known if you join now as a founding member of the society. So that's $5 a month, $60 a year. And you would be really helping us to put more of events like these on and to, uh, to broaden their, uh, their reach, to their inclusivity. I see uh, James's note in the chat, you are absolutely right. We did reach out uh, for that broadening, uh, but unfortunately the good work of actually addressing the pandemic uh, sometimes had to take priority over uh, talking about it uh, with us today. Uh, but yeah, rest assured, that is uh, definitely a focus for us. So I would encourage you to click on that link, opendatasociety.ca slash support dash sign up and, uh, and take a look at uh, what we do, and what we have to offer. Uh, I also am very excited to tell you, uh, here's a little thing about our partner organizations, yes, uh, that Go Open Data is having their uh, annual conference uh, for the province of Ontario's Open Data Association in uh, a couple weeks time. And uh, you can register now. Uh, it's very reasonably priced. It'll all be online and quite safe. And at that conference, they will have a follow on discussion to this one uh, about the COVID-19 open data ecosystem uh, involving uh, Professor uh, Tracy Lorio and uh, Jean-Noël Landry of Open North. Uh, so I'd encourage you to consider um, registering for that event or at least uh, that particular uh, session. And just click, oh, no, that's the last thing I have on the slide deck. I'm also excited uh, to tell you that as of Tuesday, we now can announce where the Canadian Open Data Summit for 2021 will be held, uh, which is to say online, but uh, in both official languages, because uh, it will be hosted by our good friends in the city of Montreal and the province of Quebec. And so I'd encourage you to visit our website and um, get, get the dates locked down on your calendar, uh, September 15th and 16th, and stay tuned uh, by joining perhaps the society or subscribing uh, so that uh, you can find out more as we publish it. And uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, close this uh, webinar for today. And uh, again, thank everybody, especially Jens and John Paul for participating. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you at future such sessions. Uh, <laughs> I guess right. it's, uh, thanks so much for having uh, having me, and uh, it was a pleasure. Yeah, thank thanks. you. All right, uh, I'm going to call it a day. Uh, bye, bye, everybody. Thanks a lot. Bye, bye.